Hello and welcome to the Two Robbies podcast, your destination for in-depth discussion and analysis of the Premier League and the Champions League. I'm Robbie Musto, he's Robbie Earl, and here are today's topics. Manchester United come from behind to draw with Newcastle at St James's Park. Man City and Leicester's City's nine-goal thrill at the Etihad. Chelsea back on track thanks to a second-half winner from Romelu Lukaku at Villa Park. Both Spurs and Arsenal with impressive victories over Palace and Norwich. And West Ham step up at home to Southampton. That's what we've got coming up in today's episode. All right, Robbie Earl, I think a very good place to start is mm. St. James's Park. Park. And I think it's been a while since we've seen St. James's Park so electric, so excited, so happy in some mm. ways. Um, atmosphere, Rob, 52,000 there to see Newcastle, I think, perform with as much energy and quality at times as we've seen for quite a while. And a, and a very encouraging 1-1 one, one for them. I think they're right to feel a little aggrieved. I think the general performance level and the chances created deserve to win the game mm. against a disappointed Manchester United. Um, but let's start with Newcastle, Robert. Yeah. And we know it's how difficult it's going to be for Eddie Howe to mm. keep this team in the division. Um, good signs today, my friend. Yeah. I, I thought it was one of those days, Rob, when well, Eddie Howe needed that kind of performance, that the football, his players needed that kind of performance, and the fans did. I, I kind of, in my notes before the game, was writing that I haven't really seen enough yet. You know, Steve Gerrard's gone in at Villa, and you, you kind of see with your eyes, wow, you know, that, his fingerprints. Seeing Antonio Conte at, um, at Spurs, and you say, wow, I can see that. Just didn't think we hadn't, we hadn't seen it. I didn't want a desperate performance, but I wanted a bit more of a committed performance from Spurs, that, that, from um, Newcastle, that, that kind of showed his... You know, we know we're in a fight and we can get out of it and we have got good players and we can play the ball. And I thought we got a lot of those good things today that showed me why Newcastle, with Eddie Howe, will believe they've got a chance of getting out. Because if, if they can keep that level, and we know how, how things go up and down, injuries and, and, and COVID at, at the moment, mm. but if they could keep that kind of approach and commitment and drive, they'll be all right, Rob, because they'll get goals. There's goals in that team. They'll be okay. Well, they, they would be okay. And hopefully those injuries, Rob, yeah, because, yeah, that's a bad you know, one, yeah. I, we, with the Carl and Wilson one looked pretty bad, lower yeah. part of his leg. Um, yeah, they're talking about maybe a Alan cough on as well. His cough, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so those two players, Sam Maximin and Callum Wilson, I think everybody would agree are the most important players for them in terms of their fight to stay in the Premier League. Now, mm. other players stepped up. Um, Joe Ellington, I think you mentioned it on the broadcast today, Rob, was was superb, absolutely superb as a number eight in midfield. They found this position, I think, after a previous game where he had to play as a number eight, kind of a box-to-box midfield player. Um, they were concerned about his defensive kind of abilities, but he did a great job in that game and he showed it again today. Now, we've talked a lot about Joe Ellington yeah. and mostly, to be fair, it's been in a derogatory God, you know, for all that money, he hasn't really done much as a centre forward. And he hadn't done much as a striker. But there's no question that he's got a big heart and he's got a big, he's actually got a big engine. He can get up and down. He can do his defensive jobs. He's going to be useful in the middle of the park. So I thought him, I thought he typified really that performance from them. Yeah. And there was a moment, I think, Rob, in the end, towards the end of the first half, where Newcastle were pressing like crazy. Mm. Fans loving it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's just, that's great. And it is Man United. And I think we know from our playing days that you do, there's an extra buzz, yeah. particularly in the evening game under the lights against the big, the big champion teams and the massive clubs. You do find extra energy. Yeah. They've got to find that, that energy um, going forward, particularly if they're going to be without Callum Wilson uh, and Alisson Maximum for a period of weeks. That's got to be a concern, even though, my goodness, that's what the Newcastle fans want, yeah. Rob. That's yeah. what they want. They yeah. want flipping attacking football. Uh, brilliant goal from Alan Sachs Maximan. It comes inside and just reaches and still finds a way to find the back of the net. The energy, the closing down. And also, Rob, we shouldn't. You talked about uh, Eddie Howe there. His, his team was set up really well mm. to stop Man United between the lines. Yeah. They were tight, they were mm. compact, they worked really well together. We know that every team that he's going to pick is going to be, a, in terms of the personnel, attacker minded teams. I thought they had a really got good job defensively without the ball against Manchester United. Yeah, you were right. I mean, Bruno couldn't get in the game in it, it, during the first half, couldn't really influence it. Rashford, similar, there was no real threats 
from United, Ronaldo was coming deep and trying to link the play, couldn't, was, was just getting more and more frustrated. And you're right, because I, I just looked at, at, at the, um, the next four games for Newcastle because they've had this really tough period, you know, Liverpool, Man City, United, Leicester, you know, tough teams who probably have struggled against. But the next four, Robert, Everton, Southampton, Watford and Leeds. That's got to be points on it. That's right there where you've got to get yourself some points and give yourself a shot of closing mm. that gap and getting back amongst it. Um, mm. It's going to be interesting with this January window. You talked about the two injuries that, that they've sustained today that, that aren't going to help. And, you know, th- th- there's going to be a lot of eyes on, you know, we know the wealth of, of the ownership of this club, whether they're going to chuck money around and just go and get people. Or is it going to be... I hope they don't, Rob, because I don't think that's the right way to go. You've got, you know, the second half of the season to improve your, your group and, and your quality... Well, you've got to get the right people in. It's got to be the right fit. It's got to be people who are going to enjoy going to Newcastle and living there and, and, and being part of it. Because if, if you make one or two bad ones there, I just don't like the feel of what everybody's like, oh, Newcastle got the money, they'll be able to spend it. That doesn't guarantee you anything. It doesn't guarantee you, Rob, but I'm surprised to hear you say that. That they I, I, Listen, I understand that you get the wrong people in. It, it, it certainly hinders and not help mm. the situation. Mm. But surely, Rob, that they, they've got to find some value in the market. They've oh, got to yeah, find some sure. sorry, more more quality. They've well, got you to hope, quality. You hope they've done some homework and, and they've researched and, and they <clears throat> have got a bit of intelligence about the people they're bringing in, the characters <clears throat> they're bringing in, what they're going to bring to the football club, and, and you know, moving forward. I, I just, I, I'd hate for them to go for the wrong people just because it's they've got a big name and it's Newcastle and everyone thinks they've got big money. Because that, I just mm. don't think, it is what Eddie Howe is going to need. What you saw today was a group of players who were pulling together, were pulling for the managers, who loved playing in front of that place. And when that place rocks with 50,000, Rob, and they're shouting and screaming your name, there ain't much, many better feelings in football. OK, Rob, so let's switch it on to Manchester United. Um, mm. A difficult job. I think we both realise that for Ralph Ragnick. Um, he's had a limited time. I think we've got to mm. say that training-wise. And trying to get his philosophy over and his um, principles over. We've seen this 4 2 2 2 system used in previous games. It yeah. looks like right now uh, that's what he prefers. Mm. But this was a struggle to watch, Rob, wasn't it? This yeah. was really, really yeah. poor from them. I thought they looked super narrow, which is what, is what mm. kind of the system yeah. kind of calls for, really. Um, I thought the spaces are on the outsides. But you would argue in this 11 players, Dallo and Tellis are maybe the wor- two of the worst players on the ball that you want the space to go to. I want the space to go to wide players and I want to pick it up by Rashford or a Greenwood. But the space is there for the fullbacks who aren't their best players. I don't think that's ideal. I still I still think that the team, and this was problem under Ergun and Solskjaer, it looks disjointed. It looks not connected in any way. Um, and when you think about the front four players, I think, and I'm going to throw it up to you in a minute, Rob, with this. Like, I think in Greenwood, Ronaldo, Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford, the general consensus of opinion is these are really great players. Mm. These are really great players. Yeah. There's a great front four. Yeah. Well, first off, two points I'm going to make before I throw it over to you. First off, three of them are very similar. And the way that they play, dribbles, runs, shots, Ronaldo, Greenwood and, and Rashford, Rob, very mm. similar. Not really combining, connecting, clever players, like Bruno is. So Bruno's very different. And Bruno can, can put the passes. I liked his role in the second half a little bit deeper to yeah. try and get the play going. But in Greenwood, Rashford and Ronaldo, man, are they disappointing. they disappointing, Rob, in terms of their involvement and general effect on the game. Mm. And I know Greenwood's the youngest one and, and probably the one that we should be more patient with. But shouldn't we be expecting more, particularly from Marcus Rashford, Rob, uh, and Ronaldo as well, who, who of course, is, is capable of the spectacular, mm. but in the Premier League of recent games, has done very little. There's a lot to con- consider here, Rob, but just those front four players, in terms of their quality and their reputation and the way that they should have chemistry that we expect them to combine, how disappointing were you today in those four? Well, and it comes back a little bit, Rob, to, you know, the part of the question is, does that system best suit them? Yeah. In, 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 in the way they play, because they narrow, they're in amongst each other. You know, John Joe Shelby was, was been able to snuff a lot of the, the dangers yeah. out because he was a spare central guy in the middle. Whereas Rashford, I think, when he's got space on the outside, can manipulate it well, then come in and play his combinations. 
So again, I, I, I don't think I don't think Manchester United were just a system away from being a good team. I still think there's work to be done, Rob. I think there's, there's still lots of work to be done. Uh, they gave the ball away very cheaply today. Got got hit on transitions a number of times. When Dello went forward, they hit Tate Maximum down that line, right hand side. They nicked balls off Fred and McTominay in the middle of the park and, and set things up quickly with, with good triggers from Eddie Howard. I, I just feel as though, you know, they've had two 1-0 wins under Ragnick. They didn't play particularly great against Norwich. Um, David Hay, I think, ended up being man of the match and they won the game. And, and, and that's great, winning in clean sheets. But I still feel like it's a work in progress. I feel, feel like there's bigger issues to Manchester United than just getting a system. You, like you say... It's an interesting point you say, like, you know, should we get more out of Rashford, Sancho, you know, Ronaldo, great players like that? The question is, why aren't we? Because you say they're all similar, and I sort of hear your point that you're making. They kind of like to try and do the same thing. But there's an argument, all Man City players is similar. You know, did they need Jack Grealish? He's similar. But they still find a way working out scoring goals. But they're, com- they're combining players. Yeah. They're combining players, Rob. So they I know, use but each you other. Still, the still kind of argument was players. when when they bought Jack Grealish says, well, do they need another Jack? He's only another one of what they've got. And and, yeah. and and what I'm saying is when those players are on form, they can combine, they can score brilliant goals. And they're a team that we've said at the start of the season could win a title. We were talking about them could win a title with that group. You bring Ronaldo into what else do you add? You bring Varane at the back. You bring Sancho, the wide player. All of a sudden, those were the, the holes we were thought, talking about filling and saying, eh. we had a really interesting conversation the other day where I said to you, look back at that Leicester team. And Mahrez was, 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 a, was a talent and already got brilliant goals. Drink water in midfield. N'Golo Kante probably was the other world class. Danny Simpson was right back. Christian Fuchs was left back. Robert Huth was centre half, and Wes Morgan was centre half. Mark Albrighton was one side. They won a title, Rob, with half the ability that Manchester United have got. Half the ability. But they're a team. Correct. And, and, That's and the we difference. St- we're still. These are. This is still, still individuals. Team. This is still individuals. A lot of very good individuals. And I said it on, on my thing today, we still haven't got a team. We still haven't got a team framework. I'm not sure if the 4 2 2 2 is going to totally suit this group. And then we come to the big conundrum does he go away from the system or does he stick to the system and bring in the players who suit it? I, I think we saw in the second half, Rob, slight, slightly mm. different, mm. where Bruno did come further yeah. deep, but he yeah. was still allowed to get forward. And those wide players, I think it was Sancho, wasn't it, and Rashford, played wider. Yeah. I, I think when we've seen the best of Rashford, uh, Jaden Sancho, I think it's in the wider areas. Mm. They're not they're not number tens. Mm. And so your point, and I'm I'm with you, it's one of the first things, you know, they still trying to is Ragnar still trying to force this team into this system mm. where it just doesn't look comfy. I don't, I don't think Greenwood looks comfortable playing alongside Ronaldo. Mm. Ronaldo throwing his arms around and, yeah. and a, a face like a slap. Frustrated day, one, wasn't he, know. today? Yeah, he was frustrated. Yeah, he was frustrated. Today, wasn't he? Yeah, it's, uh, and Ragnar afterwards was interesting, Rob, when he talked about, it's not about systems today, it's about mm. physicality. Yeah. He's saying we didn't match them physically. And I think that's also, actually, yeah, it was kind of a valid point. The interviewer mm. wanted to push him on systems yeah, and different yeah. players and, uh, you know, should be getting more on the body language of the players and all that. And I think he was right. There was no, that's a, that's a tough, you know, St. James's Park, when, it, when it's up for that and mm. that effect on their players, that, that really yeah. boosts their energy levels and their determination. And you've got to match it as a player. You've got to match it. And United didn't do it today. Now, there'll be other games, I'm sure, the United with this team, even the same system, will do a much better job. But it, to, in this game against Newcastle, God, I, th- I thought they were really poor. And I, and I understand the frustration of the Man United supporters that want something different. They thought they might get something different. But you said it. And, I, and I, when you said a work in progress, and there's a lot of work to do, I agree, Rob. But again, are, the, are these players, given the, the quality of Liverpool yeah. improvements at Chelsea yeah. and, of course, the quality at City, i just wondering now, it's been a couple of managers, mm. whether some of these players... Well, we know at the, mid, the midfield to McTominay and Fred are okay. They're steady eddies, Rob. Mm. I think Dallow and Telles are okay. This shouldn't be okay. I'm not sure Rashford's living up to the billing for, for quite a long period of time there. Greenwood wants, needs, needs it a little bit differently. Ronaldo's mm. much... 
I just don't know whether this team and this squad is as good as what we and many people think mm. they are. Yeah, well, it's like we see days like today and you question it. You see good days when it, when when they're flying and you think, that God, that's a lot of talent in there. God, that, that's, a, yeah. that's a team that should go close. But it's going to be interesting in six months, second half of the season. Uh, Rangley, they've got Burnley and Wolves coming up next two games. So I'm sure we'll be looking to go and get six points there, mm. close the gap on fourth, because that's going to be the target, Rob. You know, he mm. was brought in to, to try and grab that fourth spot. Um, and anything less than that, I think, will, will be seen as failure. One place yeah. where there's no failure at the moment, the Etihad. Um, Pep Guardiola and Manchester City. Uh, great game. I think the, the, the high-scoring game ever in the Premier League on Boxing Day. Manchester City 6, Leicester 3. I mean, what a game mm. this was, Rob. Man City go 4-0 up. Leicester go back to 4-3. Man City then go and get another couple of goals to see it off. And kind yeah. of, I thought, in a way, sums up a little bit about Leicester. I said, like, can score goals, have got good ability, just don't seem to be getting things right and, and get disappointments, don't get over the disappointments mm. very well. City thought was a bit of a warning. Um, obviously, the four goals, Pep had a word about that, that they, they sat off and allowed Leicester to come back into it. But again, it's mm. another win for Man City, mate. It keeps them ticking along at the top of the table. Um, what would you take away? More good City, poor Leicester? Uh, I think a little bit of both, actually, Rob. I think Leicester, um, I said it yesterday about, like, I never really, I, I, I don't really see Leicester really fighting for mm. in games. I never see them really rolling their sleeves up and having a go or being defensively strong together as a team. My my, my thoughts of Leicester and Brendan Rodgers are silky. You know, play lovely football with Vardy and Madison's in form right now. Tiedemann's pass is a little bit of quality. He might score a great goal. Um, and I understand. I'm just going through the teams for tomorrow's matches with, with Leicester. Um, they've got Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool, they've got Man City yeah, and Liverpool yeah. in three days. Pretty remarkable. But they have got a ton. They've mm. got a ton of defensive injuries, which obviously isn't helping. So um, it's a tough time for Brendan Rodgers right now. I get that. But yeah. but I just, I would, if I was a Leicester fan, I just want to see a little bit more determination to try and put things right and not feel sorry for themselves, Rob. I think yeah. there's one thing. It looked like they feel it. When listen to the manager, not like him, you yeah. know, to start picking out uh, the referee, the referee and, uh, with a penalty and that, yeah, yeah, and the VAR, mm. he's, he's, he's mm. kind of having to go out. It's not like him to do that. That shows the pressure is there. Yeah, but I just want to see him. I don't know. Try and pull together a little bit and grind out mm. something, which is not very Brendan Rodgers and Leicester, but I think that's what they need right now. I think for City, Rob, a couple of things for me: De Bruyne's first goal. We saw it in the game before. He looks like he's he's back to his mm. best. I think Raheem Sterling, Rob, deserves a little mention. Yeah. He got his tap in late. He got his penalty. He made the penalty. He looks sharp again. And we know this from, from Pep, that players can sit on the sideline yeah. for two, three, four, five weeks, seemingly out of favour. Maybe they are out of favour. Or maybe he's given them a prolonged rest, is what I think, yeah. I, I suspect is is the case, which is... Really great, really, when you've got when you can do that and you can re let players rest and recover. Mm -hmm. Sterling looks rested, hungry again. It'll be somebody else's turn, maybe Jack Grealish's turn now to spend spend a little bit of time on the bench. Rob, so six three goals wherever you look in the side. It's quite, it's brilliant, really, what Pep's done. I didn't think, as you know, I I worried that that they could get the goals from so many different players in midfield that they got last year. Yeah. It's not going to one, but it's going to be Foden. It is Bernardo Silva. It's going to be De Bruyne. It's going to be other players, Rob, that, that chuck in with these goals. So another example of a team that's so well grooved and yeah. coached and they've got such a big squad of 20-odd first-team players that there isn't really a best team. There isn't really. I mean, we're going to do a thing tomorrow, Rob. I don't know if you've had a chance to do yours yet. Yeah, where, I've had a look at it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The bet we're going to do mm. a best team of, so of, far. of this first half so of the season so far. Yeah. Mm. And I don't know about you, and I'm not going to tell you, but no. I've got very few. I've got very few Man City you know players. What? I had in the it. same thought, and and, and you know Did why you? that is because they're a great team. Well, you know, individually, um, you know, who's a star there? De Bruyne when he's on form, you know, Bernardo Silva's played quite well, but you know, they haven't, they haven't got that standout. They've not got the most Salah. No, no or, reliance on any one individual, no, or which two. makes him so strong. Just interesting, Rob, just to get you, your thoughts. I don't think we, we, we've touched on it as well. Rebecca touched on it um, during the game, what, what we had uh, the other day. She said about um, Foden and Grealish sort of hmm. apparently broke some uh, COVID protocols, was seen out after a game, then there's been a rest of recovery. Both have been on the bench last couple of games. Foden got like 15, 20 minutes yeah. uh, last time out. Is that Pep 
sort of teaching them a lesson? Is that a little bit of like, because you, you made a bit of a point about, you know, people have got to look after themselves and, and do the right things during this difficult time with all that's going on. Is that Pep just making sure that they know who's the boss? 100%. 100%. And I, I've heard some people talk about, God, this is really harsh from Pep. Mm. Um, you know, the guys went out for a drink after after a, they didn't really break any rules. They came in when they were meant to come in, but he just didn't like the, the way that they looked when they came back in for training. Um, it absolutely is a slap on the wrist. Absolutely. You're even talking about, you know, it's another warning for uh, for Jack Grealish's behavior off the field. Yeah. He demands the most professional players in training. I bet every minute of training has mm. to be very high level. Yeah. Of course, the game is going to be the same. And any time where he feels some of his players, maybe particularly the younger ones, but probably all of them, mm overindulge outside of their footballing lives, Rob. I think he, he, he knows about it. He cares about it. Yeah. He's going to do something about it. I do. Mm. I immediately think back to Sir Alex Ferguson and some of the stories of him yeah. burst, <laughs> bursting into parties and pulling out his young yeah, players out right, of these parties wasn't in Manchester. All them lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, I, I'm okay with it, by the mm. way. I'm okay yeah. with it. If that's the way he runs his ship, yeah. who's anybody to argue with the success that he's had? So, you know, and, and and why not, Rob? Two young English players. I was disappointed, Rob, in that. You've just yeah. had two English internationals yeah. who, like, are in the prime of your life. You've got, you're working with one of the best coaches ever in domestic football. Like, why would you not just toe the line? And, 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 and I know they're kids, and I know that at times, you know, you get caught up in things. But, but at this time, I wouldn't do anything that, that would be getting me on the wrong side mm. of Pep Guardiola if, if I was in and around our football club at the moment. Yeah, and, and uh, you know we don't we don't hear that with too many of the foreign players. I think the foreign players, Rob, even from when we played, came into a, into yeah. our game and into our profession. Yeah, and I think we were all a lot kind more of serious, weren't they? Re- really surprised at how serious, dedicated yeah. um, they were. Um, but anyway, that, that's that's yeah. A, hopefully, that's it's lesson learned. Listen, they're young players who move yeah. on, and, and I'm sure they'll get another opportunity. But um, yeah, City mm. ticking along nicely. Let's move it on to uh, Chelsea. They went away to Aston Villa. Uh, Stephen Gerrard wasn't able to be at the game. Uh, he's tested COVID, but we heard he was having Zoom calls before, during and after after the game, having his say. Would have been pleased to see his team go 1-0 up, courtesy of, of uh, Rhys James' own goal. But Chelsea did come back into it, uh, got a penalty um, before half-time. But then big change at half-time, big Romelu Lukaku come on. We talked about it in the studio and the game changed, Robin. Just before we talk about the game, I don't know if you've, you, you saw the um, Premier League update um, recently uh, of Thomas Tuchel's interview, but basically yeah. he didn't want to talk about the game. He wanted to talk about no. the COVID situation, the almost, he's talking, impossible position he's been put in and the risk to some of his players. Um, this isn't going away for people like Tuchel, is he? he, he he's very adamant about what's doing, even though his team won, even though Lukaku came back, even though Lukaku scored, he wouldn't be turned away from what's going on at the moment. No, and it, and it grabs everybody's attention. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, I think his team winning was a... I don't think you're ever going to hear these managers complain when they lose. So this is opportunity. Yeah. After a really good second half performance of Lukaku, changing everything. They went from weak and meek up front to, to strong, powerful and effective. And they won the game. But I, yeah, I mean, he kept going back, Rob, mm, and the, the mm. having to force players to play. Yeah. Didn't want to play Callum Hudson Odoi the whole game, but he has to. He has other injuries mm. happening. Very, very strong. Yeah. Very, very strong. He said, players, players, I'm just reading some of the quotes because I wrote the same stuff down, Rob. You know, players playing that shouldn't be playing. Mm. You know, he, he, uh, he hints at the, the cup competitions. He hints at my players are international players. They never get a break. Yeah. And I got to be honest, Rob, and I know there's there's different sides of this, right? And I, and. I, I I understand the likes of top, um Right, in fact, it's the German coaches, isn't it? Yeah, it's Thomas Tuchel, Klopp, it's yeah. uh, Ralph Rangnick, yeah. and it's Jurgen Klopp. Klopp yeah. Now, their, their league's very different, or they're, they're the, the Bundesliga. Hmm. There's 18 teams. There's only one cup competition. Yeah. They have a huge, a four-week, I think, three or four-week winter break. Yeah. If you're used to that <laughs> and you come to England. <laughs> now, I'm not, you know, it's very different. And we love it because it's different. Yeah. But I do think that there is some truth in there and some common sense that... Hmm. Surely there's a way that the top players now, Rob, we want to see the best players play at the best level yeah. with a little bit of recovery. The 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 two the, the one day rest the play again. And I think and the COVID thing has obviously 
exaggerated yeah. their feelings on this yeah. run because it's obviously a lot worse when you've got people ill yeah. coming in, players that have to play or the game will be postponed. It really is a tough situation because of the virus. But mm. even so, I still feel, and this is my opinion, yeah. that, that the football authorities, the Football Association, the Premier League, have got to look at trying to ease the load on, on top players, top mm. clubs that represent English football in the Champions League. They're, they're, they're exhausted and they risk injury. So I'm for one, yes, we're different. We love our football. We mm. love our festive period. But I think there is room for some, come on, let's try and figure out something a little different. Are you, are you different well, to me, Rob, on that? Um, well, I think I'm a little bit different. Is, is You know, this COVID virus, it, it, you know, we just don't know what form it takes, how it's moving, how it's spreading. And I think those are unique uh, circumstances that, deserve unique attention and, and on those on those matters i think you're right now there is an argument that the premier league could have had a break for the last couple of weeks if the club executives had voted that way last monday when they had the meeting rob the people who are running the football mm. club decided they didn't want a break they wanted to run now whether that's to do with financial repercussions that would have come some tv money coming back people like amazon prime who have got a big piece of the festive games might have wanted all money back i don't know but it seems like there's a disconnect between maybe some of the people running the football club and maybe some of the yeah. people running the football teams as in coaches and managers so i do get yeah. that um the festive fixtures i'm one of them who likes it i understand the the pull on players the draw on 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 maybe less competitive games, more injuries. But for me, it's what makes the Premier League unique. It's part of what makes it what it is. Uh, yes, in Germany they don't, and they have one competition, and that's fine. But if you come to England and that's what we do, you kind of know that's what you're coming to, or, or go and manage in one of the other leagues. I just look at some of the teams. I mean, it was interesting, because I was thinking about a team like Chelsea, and I'm not saying... Again, I'm talking about the Tuchel situation because I think he's got a very valid argument with what he's talking about. And if the health and fitness of players is at risk, mm. that's fine. Mm. But let me. I was having another thought. It was only this morning I heard a bit of a radio debate and I thought, so Chelsea are an interesting one. So let's say Chelsea's squad, if they had kept hold of, of, of Brozier, if, if Conor Gallagher, if some of these people, they could have. They still got talented players around their football team who they've let go out on loan because they want to get... You can, only have so, you, can, you can only have so many players in the squad, Rob, can't you? Yeah, I know. You have to give a list of 25 players or something. You can't, you can't have everybody available. Yeah, I know. But there's some of these... Now we're in a situation, you can bring in academy players, can't you? Well, if they've got, they've got first-team experience, then they're expected to play, yeah, to make yeah. up the 14, 13 outfield and one goalkeeper yeah. to make sure a what game I'm is... What I'm saying to player. Chelsea is, with, with the quality of, of the number of players they have in their squad, if that was a route they wanted to go down... They could do, and they probably could afford to. All I'm saying is there's no easy, simple answer to this because the Burnleys of the world, it's a whole different story. And I understand why Sean Dyche is saying, hold on, that, you know, these things suit the, the bigger clubs. With, with, you know, you talk about the five substitute rule now. Ragnick's gone quite big on that. And, and Sean Dyche is saying, well, yeah, that's all right for you because you've got the big squad with all the big players. He hasn't. So it, it's got to be, you know, and when these things, you know, the point you make and, and should football... Um, address it i think that the 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 obvious answer to that is that if the premier league wanted to it can it's about the premier league's about 20 votes each club mm, having a yeah. vote if, if all yeah. those 20 clubs wanted to do something they could do something but then mm. it's got to be the people running it and it might mean less money but that's what's what that's the consequence it goes back to your problem your point rob about there's a disconnect between the yeah. the players the yeah. manager and the, the chief executives it. that are going into the meeting say, well, actually, we're okay to keep going through. That That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just back on the football, Let's I just want to get... Football. Yeah, yeah, the Chelsea, yeah, yeah, just on... I, I know I know Lukaku is going to be... I think... I, I'm not sure there's much needs to be said. We know he's important to the team. Mm. We know what he brings. We know how different they are with him. We know how they get... They have so many opportunities to cross the ball. Lukaku being there is miles better. Mm. Just wanted to get your take on Christian Pulisic, Rob, because there's... Yeah. I mean, I think everybody knows where his best position is, and it will be in the Mason Mount or the Callum Hudson Odoi, yeah. the little yeah. the little withdrawn players mm. behind the main number nine. Now he yeah. played as a number nine in yeah. that first half, and then he yeah, moved to wing back. It, yeah. So I, I thought at right wing back. Now again, it's not his best position, but I think we've got to start being realistic, Rob. 
he isn't. He doesn't seem to be a a what a, a best two choice for those two number tens, mm-hmm. those positions that are just so behind the mind striker. Does he have to try and make wing back absolutely his own, or or is it going to be the best? situation for him to move on and find another club in the Premier League or anywhere else where he can play regular football. The frustrations must be building in him playing in spots that he doesn't really like. But I would say on the second half as a wing back, I don't mind him there because he's going to be advanced all the time because they have so much control and territory uh-huh. and he can use his dribbling skills in the box. What do you think? I think we had this conversation a little while ago and I said, you could he play wing back? And you went, nah, not really, yeah, he's not wing no, back. I know. And, I, and I, I remember I did an uh, Inside the Mind with him, Rob, and I talked about where's your best position, where would you play? And he kind of threw, listen, I'd play anywhere, but I want to be in the 10. And, and my view of the situation is, I don't think he will start regularly in w- one of the two number 10. So there's two spots there. I don't think he'll regularly start there. He might play when people are injured. He might play when there's rotation. I don't think he will start. I think he will always be an impact sub, a 25, 30-minute guy if things aren't going well or whatever. I do feel that the wing-back role could be something he could possibly make his own. In a wing-back, in a wing-back system, bear with me first, in a wing-back system, in a wing-back team where you're going to have more possession than the opposition... You're going to be higher up the pitch than you, you would normally be. And yes, you might have to learn a little bit of defence. But if Rich James went in as, as a left, right side, he's centre-back. Let's say Aspilicueta, they decide that he's been brilliant for him and they let mm. him go. And then yeah. all of a sudden you've got his pace that picks a ball mainly, Rob, I'm saying, from the halfway line forward, not less from yeah. the halfway line back. There's mm. an asset there that he could find himself in good spots going forward. And we've seen those players who can... You know, Trent Alexander-Arnold is a fullback who runs a game like a, a, a midfield mm. player. Jao Cancelo uh, at Manchester City is a, is a fullback who runs a game from midfield. Could Christian Pulisic be a wide player who can affect a game high up the pitch from a wing-back position? Uh, listen, Rob, why I pulled my face and why I argued with you before about, about him being a wing-back mm. is that, yeah, potentially, possibly, Rob, but we're forcing it. He's a 10. For me, he's a ten, or he's a he's a he's a wide forward in a four three three. Um, but he's not a ten at Chelsea, co- is he, Rob? He's not. He's not well, a ten I mean. at Chelsea, that's I mean. and that's why I asked you. That's why I asked yeah. you because it doesn't yeah. look like. I mean, if you ask him, that's where he wants to play, and he's he's done some good things at times, Rob. He's done, okay. But let, it's just let me put another in question. Team, it's, it's really interesting what what you say. Let me put another question. If you're a ten, let's say he goes to. I'm trying to be reasonable. Let me look down the league. Let, let's say he leaves, Rob. We, we, we're just going down the line, and he goes yeah. to West Ham. Yeah, D- decent enough. Or where, you know, or I'm thinking the kind of level of club at Leicester. I think does it does does <laughs> their play and the way the amount of possession he'll get put him in the best light to be a number ten? I'm not so sure. So what's your point? Like I, what what you saying? He's not a ten. No, I hear your point, and, and I think, Rob, he is a number 10, but I'm saying, is it better to be a number 10 at a, let's inverted mm. commas, lesser club, where you might not get as much ball, you might not get in as good position, or is it better to be a wing-back in a big six, top three team, where he can go and influence the game and still be part of it? That's my concern with saying, oh, if I'm going to be a 10, I'll go somewhere else. I'm not sure somewhere else always is going to be the right fit. No, that's a great point, because... He, he could play in his preferred position, but in a less successful team. And that, mm. that's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I put myself in, it's really difficult. I, I, I want to say, I want to win things if I'm, if I'm his ability player. Mm. I want to win things, but I, I also want to enjoy my football. I want to play where I want to play. Yeah. And also, Rob, you know, the, the reality is, is he going to force himself regularly in front of Reese James? He's not. So he'll, he'll be a sub wing back instead of a, sub number 10 in the Chelsea side and I still think ultimately mm. under Thomas Tuchel it doesn't look like he's going to be one of the regular starters so yeah. no I would leave I would leave and go somewhere else where he can still be a star he can still win things you know on the back of this I don't know where he could go Jurgen Klopp might pick him up you know you, you, I don't know the, the fee would be big yeah, yeah. but I, I, I think it's starting to look like and there's you know nothing needs to happen crazy quick but it's just I'm sure he 
and Pulisic fans, particularly here in the US, yeah. want to see him play at his best. And his best is when he's in tight spaces or he's taking on um, fullbacks, he's facing forward, he's got a little bit of space to do his creative, sharp, quick, gets himself goals and stuff. And, and, and it's just frustrating when he's kind of pushed up as a number nine, pushed over as a wing back, better in mm. this game. Um, it's just long, long-term long vision is, yeah. you know, he's, he's, still, he's still trying to impress the coach yeah. to, to, make him a, to make him a regular first-team important player. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some t- difficult mm. times maybe for Christian Pulisic, but he's got to find his spot. No doubt Chelsea will be better, though, with Lukaku in there, Rob, just what he brings yeah. and the players underneath. So we'll see how he keeps fit and, and how things go for, for Chelsea. They go to Le- uh, Liverpool, don't they? Uh, in early January, Chelsea Liverpool, uh, January the second. Yeah. I think that game comes up. That's going to be. And also, by the way, Rob, just let me just in- interject there real quick. The uh, the African Cup of Nations, yeah. the players getting together is going to be the day after that game. That's right. Yeah, they've got so, more time. Aren't they? Most Salah, they got mm. more time. And that's what um, Chelsea were particularly yeah. uh, Liverpool were really worried about mm. losing those players For that before game. that Chelsea game. So yeah. I think it's confirmed that they'll go to that competition yeah, after, after that the, Liverpool the, the Chelsea Liverpool game, game, which, which really helps. Second. Yeah. Yeah, great game to for that. that one. Let's move yeah. on to Spurs, my friend, Antonio Conte. Um, mm-hmm. Fingerprints all over the Spurs team at the moment. Uh, 3-0 win against Palace, a clean sheet, three goals. Very different from the Nuno Espirito Santo uh, Spurs team we saw that were quite passive, that played with, with less pace and, and less aggression. Um, we're, starting to, we're starting to get a good feeling about Conte. Warm and fuzzy. Is it warm and fuzzy muzzy? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. And to be fair, I think we expected it. I think mm. we agreed that it was a brilliant pickup for Spurs. Really great appointment. Um, and it's going to take a little bit of time to build a foundation and the team play and the shadow play and the little the little kind of the regular movements, particularly defensively, we're starting to see it. Eric mm. Dyer is a player that, I'll be honest, I've not, I've not fancied for his defensive abilities. I don't think he's been particularly quick. He's been, I thought, it was a fault for a lot of the goals in in recent months. Looks a reborn player with a manager that said great things about him mm. individually. Tanganga came in. I think Ben Davis has been a lot better when I haven't been a big fan of him yeah. defensively. But this is regular drilling as a back three or a back five in a team. Regular patterns, and you're seeing the benefits of it now with a strong foundation. And they've always had quick with Lucas and Son and, and Harry Kane and Delhi as well. We're going to see maybe more of. There's, there's, there's plenty of players there that it does stream a counter-attacking side. It's what Antonio Conte really built his career on. And I thought it was a classic counter-attacking Antonio Conte type of performance. You ain't going to get high pressing with, uh, no, with Spurs, no. this Spurs. You're not. You're not going to get high pressing. Forget that. They drop back. It's the way it is. Sometimes that can frustrate fans, Rob, when they're on the back foot a little yeah. bit, even at home. I mean, in the first 20, 30 minutes, uh, I'm like, wow, Palace... Yeah, they got to be happy. Ball, they? They're yeah. controlling the possession. Mm. They're enjoying the game. They can knock it wide. But Spurs are super strong back there. They're very strong, well organized, and they're ready to counter attack. And we saw it. Otherwise, a particularly good game for my underappreciated performer this weekend, Robbie Earl. Mm. Lucas Mora. Lucas Mora. A, li- a little bit underappreciated, I feel, in general. So when these guys come up and do something good in games, mm. we talk about it because it's important. Kyomin Sun, top goal scorer at the club. I get it. Brilliant player. Harry Kane, say no more, brilliant player. But Lucas Moura, now and again, in big games, as he's done in the, in the Champions League, it steps up and is capable of energy and, and of pace and of, of final ball and of finishing. And it was a really good day for Lucas Moura yeah. in a team, Rob, and a manager that, that could be very quick to change a front three mm. to a front two. And yeah. it's Lucas the drops to the bench because they'll play another midfield player in Delhi or in Dombali or somebody else. So not only is he trying to obviously play well for his team and win games, he's trying to make sure he stays in the team and persuades his manager that a, a, a three up front and two in midfield is a way to go. And, and he had a brilliant game. Two assists and a goal. Yeah. Well done, Lucas yeah. Moura. Play, played well in the League Cup as well. Um, and we goal and, mm. and assist in that one as well. Interesting question for you, because I was thinking about this again, and I thought, let me chuck this one at Musty. Um, what's the difference between Mourinho and Conte, then? Because Con- Mourinho wants to drop off and to sit deep and control the ball. and, and, and I mean, I have my own view. What, what's the difference? You know, and it didn't work for him at Spurs, so why is it going to work for Conte? Mm. 
Well, I think the difference, Rob, what I've seen, I think there's an immediate difference in his his relationship with players. Yeah. Man management. Absolutely. That's that's obvious. Yeah. I think I think being know, an ex player, it, Rob, sorry, just putting it, I think being an ex player yeah. helps there. I think Marino at times doesn't realise when he's been off how it can affect you in as a player and in an, as a as a group. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're right. And I think that grating, the, the, the longer in his career he's got on, that's become very, very prominent. Mm. falling out with players and want to make examples of players. I think Conte does it a little bit differently. I think he's equally as maybe more passionate and he, and he can be a, a real hard ass as well. There's, mm. there's no getting away from that. I think another difference is I think, I think Conte believes a lot more in, in this, this drilled set way of playing that everybody's going to know what to do. These hours of shadow play, mm. I'm not aware that Mourinho does the same sort of work that right, that, that regard, but you're kind of right, Rob, where it's mm. a, a sit back, mm. let's have a little, see what's going on. We're yeah. going to be strong and we're going to hit on the counter attack. Mourinho's yeah. done that to great success, yeah. particularly in his early part of his career. So it's a good question mm. and it's not too dissimilar in terms of the look of the game and the rhythm of the game. Yeah. But I just think, I just think the players are, are loving. Mm. We're hearing, you know, the training's yeah. intense. Um, the, the passion from the managers coming across. Harry Kane looks interested and engaged and, and back on side. And it's down to the man management, the difference. I think the, the professionalism, the attention to detail that I think that, that wasn't quite there with Mourinho. And that, of course, the man management styles are very different. Mm. And I think when you've, when you've done as well as you have as Antonio Conte, Rob, and you're a player in that dressing room, well, he's won, he's, he's won respect, everywhere. It? He's, yeah, he's yeah. got to be a lot of respect. Mm. And then Mourinho has as well, but yeah. there's a sense when he's a Spurs. It's a slightly different that, way, isn't it? Yeah. He was dropping off his best work, yeah. I think. And, and, and mm. uh, again, I just heard, uh, I think Tim Howard sat down with, with Harry Kane recently and I, I heard that one. It's interesting where uh, Harry was saying that Conte wants him playing a little bit higher now. You know, we've seen him dropping totally. in and that. You know, get yeah. push up there. I think there's a little bit more attention to that attacking with Conte maybe than there is with Mourinho. It almost feels like there's a bit more balance with him. But I think Josie yeah. was so, you know, 70% on the defending and then we'll get it forward. Yeah. Looks to me like he puts as much store in once we've won it what we're going to do and how we're going to break quickly. Well, that's great, Rob, because it, it, it reminds me of, a, of, so I missed our podcast. I went away with, with my family for a few days. Yeah. And as you and Tim did the podcast, mm. and I did watch back that game, um, the Spurs and uh, Liverpool game. Liverpool and it goes, yeah. it goes to that point. I, mm. I was, I couldn't believe what a great, game plan set up the Spurs had yeah. with them flipping the ball over the top, mm. turning Liverpool at every occasion. Eric Dye now, and again, this is part of what he's in, uh, been instilled from his manager, yeah. is looking for those diagonals, any ball over the top that he wasn't looking at before. Yeah. Same thing with Harry Winks, Rob, the way he lifted the ball mm. over the top. Now, Liverpool are vulnerable because they're super high. Mm. They have, the fullbacks go forward, of course, which is a great part of what they do, but that gives makes them vulnerable. And Antonio Conte, time after time, I'm like, they're I mean, they didn't even look to play through midfield. They just didn't play through yeah. midfield. Yeah, yeah. It was a little flip ball. I'm like, and then that's been worked on. And that's to your point that maybe he's got more of a balance on attacking themes yeah. more than just sitting back and just waiting for a slip or a turnover or a, or a, or a mistake that they pounce on Mourinho's team. Mm. So I'm pleased you brought it up because it just triggered my memory. Like, and I didn't have a chance to say it because I wasn't yeah. on that, that yeah, yeah, the point, podcast. Yeah. But the the uh, the way that they played behind and had a, had a set plan there, it just it just looked like it was planned mm. with discipline, with accuracy, and with quality. And players love that. Players love yeah. a plan. Absolutely. I tell you, a man with a plan who's loving it at the moment is Mikel Arteta, my friend. Oh, uh, went down to Carrow Road and his team put five past. A bit of a hapless knowledge. You're having a bit of a difficult time of things after a, a good start under, under Dean Smith. Um, Another good day for the young guns, mate. Uh, Martin Odegaard in midfield is outstanding at the moment, building everything through him. Uh, Saka Martinelli, Smith throw when he comes on. Lacazette looks like he's enjoying his football. Um, I don't know if you ever got, got the chance of I think it's the first Saka goal. If you get a chance to watch it again, uh, if it's on our Premier League update or whatever, the celebration, just watch Granite Xhaka and, and Bukayo Saka. There's a really nice kind of... <coughs> Jack is trying to say something to him and he's running away. And, they and, it, and it was just one of them, you know me, and looking at all those things. It's like there's a little bit of a team spirit building amongst this group now. I just get the sense that they're mm. all, you know, they've all made a little step forward and they've all tightened up a little bit. And 
you know, the captain's not there, Rob, and that can be decided and sorted out for another day. But what, what they've got at the mm. moment, just feel like this group's starting to tie together and starting to get some of those mm. moments and times that are important with the group that you can start relying on each other. Do you think, Rob, that in, in that same kind of thought process that you're yeah. having there, that, yeah. and I, I'm a big believer in this, that sometimes there's a transitional period with a new manager and changes and new yeah. players and new team, and then there becomes a, a, a moment, and it happens over a, a course of a few weeks, where you start to really believe that, yeah. and I've said it, I've said it lots of times, like something special is happening. Mm. Now, I'm not yeah. saying that something super special is happening with Arsenal, yeah. but yeah. to your point, I think the players are now believing in themselves a lot more. Mm. They believe in the manager a lot more. There's some big moments where yeah. I'm sure the dressing room has been a bit like what you know the way that he speaks a little bit and the way that he treats players. Um, and now, like you said, like they're becoming on board. They're becoming mm. they're becoming more confident in what they've done. Young guns again, Rob, with with the goals and, and the performances. Not all of them, but Smith Rowe comes on and scores. Yeah. Uh, Saka's got a couple of goals. Tierney scores that good goal with his left foot uh, from from the corner, the, the corner of the box. Everything's going well right now. Mm. Like is it scoring goals? I just and when you look at the league table as I'm doing right now, fourth spot yeah. and clear in fourth spot is really really. Impressive work from this man with this team from Correct. where they started Correct. and the criticism initially. Correct. All I would say is I don't think that they can maintain this level. And I, I, I hope and I expect them to be in a top four race or season. But again, just with some of the bigger picture thoughts we're having that we're going to talk about tomorrow, Rob, on yeah. our show about yeah. I just don't know whether these young guns and – a, a team without uh, a Bamiyang can mm. stay yeah. in a top four. But and listen, that's that, I, maybe yeah. that's uh, the wrong time to say that, to be fair, mm. because they are yeah. playing great. Yeah. They're in great form. The young players are flying. They looked a lot. The, the defensive unit is so different, so much better. Yeah. And it's brilliant work from Mikel Arteta. Mm -hmm. Let me go another way, because you're right. And, and, and it, you know, listen, we've been critical of Arsenal and, and Arteta and, and players and the Jackers and, and all that when, when it's been mm. right. This is a time for them to enjoy. Do you know what? And this might sound a bit strange to Arsenal fans. I hope they kind of bear with me on it. But I hope if things go wrong, and I'm, I'm not totally as convinced, but I, I know what you mean. It's going to be tough to stay in that first No, spot. I say not, not and, wrong, Rob. Yeah, not, I know, not but, wrong, but, but not things winning, not, like, not continue to win as yeah, many games. They've gone five up, yeah. straight and whatever. But in a way, Rob, I would embrace that if I'm an Arsenal player now. Let me tell you why because they'll come through some difficult, and next season they'll be better for it. Yeah, because we, we keep saying about these good players, sometimes you've got to, you know, you have that run, and then you're gonna, you've got to go through some stickiness and find out about each other and, and pull through on a couple of things. And it's almost like that's the next test for this group, when that comes. And it, it might come in a week, it might come in three months. They might continue to go better than we thought. But I just think these young players... It's experience that, that's, hold, that's holding them back. It, it's game management, game Threats. time experience. Yeah. And, and whatever that is, embrace what comes with it because that's going to put you mm. in good stead. No, I, I totally agree. Well said, Rob. And that's for the manager as well. Mm. When the, the tough times are going to come. Tough times are going to come. And they're yeah. going to be stronger for it afterwards by living it, experiencing it. Yeah. And I think you know, they need reps. They need reps in mm. all these situations. The yeah. minutes they're having, the development of, of all the players, of Odegaard, of Saka, of Smith Rowe. I mean, Smith Rowe's numbers are good. Yeah. Like, really, really good for a player that's only recently really burst onto the scene. So encouraging for Arsenal and the fans. And, and they've waited a long time to be excited about something. But this team right now, with these young players is, is pretty exciting. So well done, Arteta. Well done, Arsenal. Where, where they are right, right now in the league table is pretty pretty impressive. Um, well, running through the fixtures, Rob. We're yeah, running out of time. West, yeah, let's, yeah, let's quickly go. We, we get a West Ham and Southampton because it was a great game, a bit of to and fro. Um, it was interesting because I, I was watching this one. I thought, well, fascinating, little Robbie. <laughs> he deserves a little. He deserves a bit of credit, doesn't he? He, he? You know, he goes up and he goes down, and you think they're gonna. Oh, they're on a bad run, and then he finds a way. And you know, it's all about coaching with this guy. It isn't about what he can buy. It isn't about bringing in big, big name players. He's got to coach his way out of problems. And I love that he continues to do that and find a way. And young Brozier and Elianusi, mm. and, and you know, young players Walker Peter. He takes Liveramento takes these players who yeah. maybe haven't quite made it at the big clubs and he works them and gets them better. I just thought it was a really good day for him and his football club. And, you know, I just feel, Rob, 
when they're good like they were at, at West Ham, they, they, they're just too good to go down. I know we both sort of worried about them and goals is, can be a bit of a yeah. problem. But I just think with his coaching and, and know-how and, and, and people in the team, that they're just too good to go down. And I'm just going to jump in before you even get there, mate. I want to give you my underappreciated performer of the week. Oh. And he, he, he's, he's the captain of Southampton. He's come through the academy. He's James Ward-Prowse. He's, I think, only the fourth player in Premier League history to get 10 or more penalties, 10 or more uh, direct free kicks. Um, He's a great signature for what this football club stands for. Um, There was talk a couple of years ago, I think it was, that Villa were interested, maybe when the Jack Grealish was going, and there was talk about whether he was going to be at the football club. Uh, He stayed through. And I just think he's one of those players, Rob, who never really get the credit that he deserves. Probably isn't going to play at a big enough club where he's probably going to get the, the headlines. But consistently, you know, scores a penalty, delivers the, the, the free kick for, for Bednarek's mm. header, continues to play well, whether mm. he's playing again with Elian Nusi in midfield, with Diola, with Romeo. Mm. Just just a good egg, Rob. One of those good people you, you need in your dressing room. Absolutely right. And this is the exact reason why we do this. Mm. Somebody like James Ward-Prowse, brilliant, brilliant career, yeah. super consistent. I, I'm not going to repeat what you've just said, mm. but this is why we do it. And that's a great shout. James Ward-Prowse, international player, ne- he's probably never going to go to one of the big clubs. Mm. He isn't a flashy footballer, but what a flipping good lad, mm. a steady performer, was happy and willing and couldn't was excited to sign an extension with a football club. Yeah. We don't see that very often. So, mm. yeah, it's a good shout. And he, and he is underappreciated. Uh, I'm sure not by anybody at Southampton, by the way. No, I'm sure no. they totally appreciate him. But in general, um, we should give him a little bit more love when you've done it right there. Just just a, one line for me on Southampton, Rob, yeah. about their struggle, what you thought was going to be their struggles. I think they've made, again, some good signings. Um, Tino Livramento from Chelsea yeah. has been excellent. And Armando Brogia, mm-hmm. I'll say it every time I think I watch him or see him, the way that he plays and the way he does, does things. He's had six starts, Rob, I think, going into... Boxing Day fixture, six yeah. starts, four goals. Four goals yeah. um, he had two goals in his last three before that game. So he's 20 years of age. He, I, I feel he's going to have a big future in the game, Rob. Yeah. Um, now, whether he's you know he's on loan for Chelsea uh, for, at uh, Southampton, so I don't know how long they can keep him for. But when you bring in someone like that, Rob, mm. and he hits the ground running and he looks the part and he's got personality, don't worry about his age because he looks a mature, mm. strong character. That makes a difference to a team like Southampton. Yeah, so difference. between that, bet- between Armstrong, between Che Adams, between Stuart Armstrong, who's back to fit again now, is on the mm. bench in this game. Yeah. Um, that can make the difference between being comfortable and fighting relegation. And right now, they sit on 20 points after 18 and yeah. 14th spot. Well done. I, I, I st- still, you don't really know what you're going to get with Southampton. Ralph will be all right. Don't you worry about Ralph him. He wears, his, right. wears his waistcoat. He's got his shirt and tie on the but side. He looks mate. a million he looks, bucks. Looks a million bucks. And Chelsea's factory continues to keep put, putting out players. Another player on loan that for Chelsea is going to earn them 30, 40, 50 million dollars the way this young kid Broger is going. Um, but yeah, good good news for, for Southampton to get him. Good news for Chelsea to have him out on loan. Final game um, of this window, mate, was, was Brighton 2, Brentford 0. Um, Brighton, we talked about, who you know have all this possession, but the criticism was coming that I think it was um, one win in, in 12. This was their first win in, in 12 games. That They have all this mm. possession, but they couldn't turn possession into goals and goal-scoring chances, and we're looking at, are they overdoing it? And we, even the first sort of 30 minutes of the game, we saw one or two opportunities where people almost refusing the chance to take a shot or work the goalkeeper. And then they end up with uh, a brilliantly um, constructed goal. Chossard, who's been a really good player for them this season, I think that's the fourth goal for him. He lifts one over the goalkeeper. And then Neil Mopé uh, gets his seventh club by seventh Premier League goal. Yeah. season. lovely strike, former Brentford player. And in the end, that was enough. Brentford had, had a bit of a go second half, but, but didn't really have the quality and puffed and puffed a little bit. Goalkeeper in good form. Mm. And Brentford get the, mm. uh, Brighton, Brighton get the three points. I mean, it's one of those where... Both these teams will, will, will be will be fine, I think. Uh, Brighton's ambition's probably a little bit higher than Brentford's. Obviously, be, being in the Premier League a little bit longer. Mm. Yeah, I, I just I just really like what I see from Brighton, Rob. Mm. And I know we sort of we chat, of course, when the game's going on in the studio. And I think Rebecca sort of feels like sometimes 
the Brighton can be a bit boring because they have the ball. They don't shoot. They could. They should do more with their possession. Mm. And I understand that. But I, I still like that they have that control in games. Yeah. I like the fact that they've got a great defensive record because they have the ball a lot. They mm. believe in defending with the ball, with possession. And yes, overdo it a little bit at times so they try and overplay. But when the goals go in, mm. then everything seems okay, Rob. Yeah. And, we, and I know it's the most important part, but so much else about their football is really good. Organisation, width, passing, defensive stuff because they've got a good goalkeeper. Mm. Plus, plus, they keep the ball very well. It's the last bit that needs to be fixed. Yeah. And, and that's got to be better to come from that place than a place of, oh, let's just go, you know, or, or it was before in the Chris Hewton where they're yeah. very much a reactive team that sits back and entertaining, really good to watch. And then ninth, they kept drawing. They didn't, you know, they hadn't, hadn't won for a lot of games, Rob, yeah. but they kept drawing. They're they're drawing points. They're in, they're yeah, in, they drawing eight, didn't they? They're in, they're in ninth spot. Yeah. They've got a game in Andover. They're in, ahead of Aston Villa that people have raved about in some ways this yeah. season with Stephen Jarrett's kind of instant impact. But mm. Brighton ahead of them and got a game in hand. So, and they're ahead of Leicester City. So, I, I really like what they what the manager's doing. We said it before mm. by Graham Potter. Yeah. Um, the doubts start to come when they don't win, but this was a good win. Two talented forwards that, that got their goals. Yeah. Well done. And Brentford, by the way, just disappointed robbing them. Just yeah. expected yeah. expected more quality. They tried to play out from the back. They got bogged down. It wasn't their day. They didn't get the front mm. players involved very easily or very often. Um, so I just, yeah, I mean, I think Brentford, Rob, are going to be all right. Be all right. They're uh, similar, aren't they? They've, they've got mm, 20 points, Rob. 20 points in this mm, stage of the season. They'll be all right. I mean... It's good. Yeah, 17 games. You've got games to win four or five yeah. more games and, and, yeah. and they'll be pretty good. I, I think they will. Yeah. Just a bit of an off day for them. Listen, mate, yeah. it's been uh, a bumper um, festive season for us. Bag full of goals. 28 goals in six games we had. And then we got a couple today with Newcastle and Manchester United. So it's been a full festive fixtures. Look out for our next podcast. That's going to be on Thursday, December the 30th, when we'll review a full round of games for match week 20. And there will be the last Premier League matches of the calendar year. But for now, I'm Earl. He's Musty, together with the two Robbies. Thanks for watching and listening. Please stay safe and be healthy. It's a good night from me. And it's a good night from him. Good night. Good night. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.